have, over my career, done a lot of things that seem to be non sequiturs, given previous work. And one of the things I love about anthropology is that many people will say they're not interested in what I'm doing these days, but very rarely will they say that it's not anthropology. And I think that's something we should all take considerable pride in. We are always already interdisciplinary, as it were. I'm very fond of Isaiah Berlin's distinction between foxes and hedgehogs. Used to think that hedgehogs were boring and that I was surely a fox, or perhaps a butterfly. And as my career has a great deal of past to reflect upon, I find myself thinking perhaps that I am something of a hedgehog, that I think in the same way about a large variety of things. I am certainly a large-scale thinker in the sense that details don't interest me anywhere near as much as how do we think about this in general and how do we relate theory to practice, to method, and to what is going on out there in the real world. And so when I talk about the history of anthropology, I am not separating it from the other kinds of things that I have done. On the surface, one would expect history of anthropology to be a more solitary enterprise than field work as a basis for research. It hasn't really proved to be that way, or not entirely so, um, in my practice. My master's thesis on Daniel Brinton got me involved with scholars at the American Philosophical Society. and took me into thinking about the colonial history of Philadelphia and, and a good many things that I probably would not otherwise have thought about. And certainly it was part of my understanding of Quaker Philadelphia. So um, that was not, um, that was a small piece for me, uh, not a huge contribution to scholarship, but a documentation of something that could serve as a foil for a larger understanding of professionalization of the discipline of anthropology and of the sciences in general. Um, this was the period when everybody was raving about Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions and his remark that the social sciences didn't have paradigms, which of course sent many social scientists into fits of conniption. And we all went to various degrees of, of trouble to try and demonstrate that that wasn't a good way to think about it, but that the cumulative character of knowledge production might have a somewhat different flavor for the social sciences. Okay. Um, and so for a dissertation topic, I decided to move out from Daniel Brinton as a baseline for professionalization and the replacement of classical evolutionary theory by something else to talk about the transition, which had always been portrayed as a cutoff point kind of paradigm shift between the work of the Bureau of American Ethnology for the U.S. government, budget controlled directly by Congress, staff, people who were bubblegum and shoestring operations of, of having had or con even continuing to pursue other careers. John Wesley Powell, who founded the Bureau, was a, a geologist and adventurer, um, natural science kind of approach to things. Um, it was a very WASP kind of enterprise. Um, there was anthropology at, at Harvard under Putnam with mostly archaeology and some biological anthropology. And then there was Brinton in Philadelphia. So what I decided to do was to look at what happened institutionally as well as in terms of the major figures between the Bureau of American Ethnology and what we now retrospectively see as Boazian anthropology. There was a long period when we didn't know the end of this story. 
and when people, in some sense, straddle the gap between kinds of professional practice. Boas was always trying to emphasize the professional side of these matters, wanting um, professional members of the American Anthropological Association to be separated out from the amateurs, God forbid. And in terms of, yeah, of his collaboration with, with the American Museum of Natural History and, and other museum contexts, he was in many ways less interested in the pedagogical than in the scientific import of, of the work that was being done. So there were certainly dichotomies. And Boaz's choice to base the new anthropology in, um, in universities rather than in museums was, I think, the, the seminal decision um, because the museum people did not have the same capacity to reproduce themselves as a social network of peers. On the other hand, in the early part of Boaz's career, that collaboration between university and museum was utterly critical because the museums had the funding for field work. And so somebody could offer to go collect some totem poles or masks or whatever, and they would all trundle off to the field in, um, in the summer, the academics in the summer anyway, um, and have that field work covered in some way that academic salaries certainly wouldn't have allowed as a personal expense. So it was a very, in practice, gradual transition. And what I was trying to do was show how that was documented and how Boaz, who was a master organizer, managed to play the things that were going on anyway, whether it was World's Fairs or museums or, or the um, government bureaucracy both to get things published and to get field work funded, and then to train a bunch of students whom he could place in university positions that were opening up. So it was that kind of, of approach to something, not just a documentation of what happened, but of processes set into play that Boas when he began to talk about the history, his 1904 paper on the history of anthropology, very brief, basically says nothing happened till I got here. Um, and that's not true. Much changed when he got there. And he certainly didn't tell his academic students much about how much he had initially depended on other kinds of, of support. But I wanted to tell that story. And so my cutoff point was was, well, it's, I read in terms for the dissertation up to about 1925, but my cutoff point was really the end of the First World War, after which things changed dramatically. The interwar years are another kind of, of ballpark. But by that period, in 1919, Boaz confronted, after the armistice, not at a point when his German pacifism would have been a problem, um, but confronted people who had reported to the government, in his opinion, as spies on things that were happening in Mexico. Um, there are two sides to that story, it seems to me. Um, they, they are, I mean, I agree with him. I would have taken the same position, I'm sure, but perhaps not so dramatically. Boas did not name them. Uh, one can, reading the documents. Um, one of them was J. Alden Mason, who wrote a, a really lovely letter to Boaz at the time, explaining why he felt he did what he did, and what he didn't say, as well as what he did say, in what information he passed on. It's, it's dignified and, and ethical. Um, in any case, the Cambridge um, Harvard anthropologists plus the Carnegie Institute in Washington controlled Mexican archaeology at that point, and they hated Boaz with a passion. The BAE were getting to that point, too, because things had changed enormously after Major Powell's death in 1902. So Boaz was, was um, read out of, of, it was censured by the American Anthropological Association, essentially fired from the National Research Council, and many of his students were saying, you shouldn't have done that. 
particularly Kroeber, who was a peacemaker at heart, compromiser at heart. And Boas stuck to it and just retreated for the moment. But when you look at it, even a couple of years later, he lost that battle, but he won the war in the sense that the people he had trained, and there were more of them every year, were writing textbooks that, that set out what the discipline was, and from there it became something else. What I wanted to do next um, was to take on that interwar period, which was so critical, and I didn't for a long time, so we'll come back to that. I didn't because what happened in my life at that point was that I took a job in Edmonton, Alberta, uh, where first of all it was a tad difficult to run down to the Smithsonian or to the American Philosophical Society and, and read a few more years worth of documents. I'm the kind of archivist who says, bring me the first 18 boxes that will fit on your cart and I'll tell you when I need more. I then proceed to turn over every piece of paper in the file. Now, I may, I've done that with the Boas papers twice, and they, it was a very different read in each case because I was looking for things about that transition and professionalization for my dissertation. When I came back to it much later from my biography of Sapir, I was reading for something else about how that, what evolved as a result of the university commitments. But the point is that, that one looks at all of the documentation. If you just say, bring me the correspondence with so-and-so, what you're going to get is what, it's, it's like telling a computer something and it will only spit out the answer to the question you asked, or a sociologist's questionnaire. The thing that doesn't fit in your categories will never show up. And so I have always done my work that way. So I found myself in Edmonton, Alberta, not knowing very much about Canadian anthropology at all, and began to think, okay, let's see if I can find some elders and interview them. That seemed like a plausible strategy. So I, I began to visit archives of, of major institutions when I could get to them for conferences or whatever, and to look for people I could talk to. My favorite memory of that period is high tea at the Empress Hotel in Victoria with Tom McFeet and his wife. And uh, some old lady who seemed to be related to them in some way. Anyway, so the four of us are sitting. High tea at the Empress Hotel is terribly British. Um, it's quite an event. You have to crook your finger properly to drink out of the teacup. But I went to Bryn Mawr, so I know how to do that. Um, I don't do it very often, but I know how. Anyway, we had a perfectly lovely afternoon in which Tom McFeet said absolutely nothing that showed you the underlying dynamics of people fighting to create the discipline they want. There wasn't a shred of gossip or personal opinion. And I had basically the same experience with most of the other people I talked to. They simply did not want to talk. Now, partly that professionalization was much more recent University of Toronto called what they were doing anthropology in 1925, um, though there was certainly stuff around before that. The archives at the University of, of Toronto, um, well, at the Royal Ontario Museum, they consisted of a file cabinet in a corner where people said, well, you know, if there's anything in there, you can see it. Um, McElroy's papers, I would apparently have had to tell them I wanted to do this and apply to some committee six months in advance, so I never did get to that. Um, but it just, it didn't go well. Things weren't happening well at all. So I ended up telling a story that depended on Ottawa archives and on the development of anthropology through Boasian anthropology as it came into um, to Canada with Edward Sapir from 1910 to 25, and later Diamond and Janice and Marius Barbeau at the National Museum. Now, that's the first time I got a rise out of anybody. Um, British Columbia anthropologists had a fit because one of the things Boaz did was to tell the then president, I think it was Westbrook, of UBC that he should not hire Charles Hill, too, the local amateur who worked with Indians, 
because he wasn't professional. You should wait until you have somebody who can really do it right in an institution like a university. And the um, existing ethnographic community in British Columbia never forgave Boaz or his approach to the discipline, I think, for that. And UBC retained a very British flavor for a long time. Perhaps not so much anymore, but certainly until very, very recently. Um, and was a sort of split, I think, in a lot of ways between um, um, between the people who were more social anthropology and sociology, and it was a joint department until very recently, sociology and anthropology at UBC. So it was really quite a different matter. But I did not find documents or people who were willing to talk to me in a way that, that I could make a story out of that at that point. So um, I retreated from some of that position. Um, that was a sabbatical. It didn't come out quite the way I thought it would. And began to think through the network of Canadian anthropology, the then initially the Canadian Sociology and Anthropology Association, later the Canadian Ethnology Society, and eventually CASCA, um, that maybe what we needed to do was look at the importance of departmental traditions. And that if we could get one person from each department to write up something about how things happened there. And my co-conspirator in that antic was um, the late Dick Pope at Regina, who was one of those American radicals who decided the better part of valor would be to move to Canada. Um, Interesting guy, he really was. Anyway, we, we managed to get people together for sessions at, at I'm going to say CASCA because I don't, it was presumably the CES then, but whatever it was called. Um, for a number of years, we managed to put together one or two sessions of people talking about things. I failed miserably to get anyone to write the stuff up so that you could do a whole journal issue, say, um, of, or a book of of a whole bunch of these things. And I think it was the same discomfort that, that Tom McFeet had, that there's just, there's a kind of gentleman's agreement not to air dirty laundry. And certain of the kinds of, of questions that a historian of the discipline would answer, and that later students and, and later practitioners would want to know is, you know, was it really as boring as the textbook official version of what happened? And almost always it wasn't. Now, there's certainly things that aren't public business, but there are other things that are part of understanding why things came together as they did. And I think those stories should be told. The only person that, says I, who did not write up my experiences at either Alberta or Western, but that's OK, um, never said I was consistent. The person who went home and simply did the assignment and eventually published it was Bruce Trigger talking about McGill, and it's a very good paper. But the intent was to have a whole bunch of things. You know, we had, when I did the collection which arose from all of this stuff that Dick and I had been doing, when Julia Harrison and I put together a conference of, through CASCO initially, but then we also had a a Shirk workshop grant to, to bring people. We held that one at Trent. And we tried to bring together a lot of people to simply talk about whatever they chose to about the character of Canadian anthropology. And the papers were quite different. And I think that was interesting in a different kind of way. But there were a couple more. Um, Ade Tremblay did his paper for that volume. We spent a long time trying to turn that into English. And to edit it. It wasn't, I mean, I liked reading him in French. But when he did his own English translations, it, there were difficulties, shall we say. One of my life ambitions was, was to get to a point where Adi would let me speak to him in French. He never would. He would always switch to English when he saw me coming pull himself up to absolutely full height it about here on me. 
and <laughs> and proceed. I thought he was absolutely lovely. Anyway, he did something that, that was really a very nice documentation. And um, and then we had one on, on UBC that L.B. Whitaker did, um, which was interesting. She didn't talk about a lot of things that might have been talked about, but it documents some of what happened there. For her, the issues were, a lot of the issues were around gender, and she just didn't want to go there. Um, and I think that may be true for most of the history of of United States anthropology that I have done, it's been more a question of things that are distant enough not to, well, first of all, there are things you don't say about living colleagues. And the only time I ever hit that in my dissertation research was Cracky, um, Alfred Krober's widow, whom I just, she was absolutely lovely um, brat, energy. Um, pushback and everything. Anyway, she said, I want you to be very careful what you say about Paul Radin, at least as long as Doris Radin is alive. And I said, okay. And I kept that. Um, there were things I didn't. They're wonderful Radin stories, and I did not tell them in anything that I said or wrote, except maybe in some of my classes, um, until after Doris Radin's death, which was not all that terribly long ago. Anyway, um, I think that it's, I think that the project Julia and I did, did bring together a number of things. There were people who wrote very interesting papers, some of them kind of chip-on-shoulder papers, um, about how they feel marginalized. And some of them having serious doubts whether Canadian anthropology has any structure or integrity of its own. My position on that is that it does, that there is a very distinct Canadian anthropology and when I talk to my network of American colleagues that I still maintain, um, even the ones who work with Native American materials, they really do have a different approach to what they're doing and how they're doing it. I think some of it is a question of scale. That is, we're small enough that we all know each other. And that hasn't been true, s certainly, since the First World War. Um, it has, had begun already to change, and by the end of the Second World War, it was just impossible. You had to have a much more limited kind of network. So the, the understanding of Canadian anthropology um, would need to be something that recognized a network of people who know each other often very well, although not necessarily in contexts outside the occasional meeting. Um, the Canadian Anthropology Society may seem to be a rather small and, and ineffectual thing in world terms, but I think it has created something that, that, facilitates, that facilitates good communication. I also think that you can't talk about the structure of Canadian anthropology without talking about the structure of Canadian society. And as when I was back trying to talk about three kinds of languages, immigrant, indigenous, and charter, in the same frame, I think that there's a kind of tensile strength to the binaries that divide Canada because they don't put the same people in the same binary every time we make a cut. There are regional things, there are linguistic things, there are ethnic cultural background things, there are climate things, there are which kind of industry things. There are demographics of all kinds of weird. There are urban-rural distinctions. And so there's always some possibility of understanding how the other guy sees the world, because you probably know someone who's on the other side of that divide. And even if you're opposed to the person you're talking to on a given topic, you do know that you agree with them on something else. And I think that it produces a, a very different kind of quality. I do not think there are things, many things that are unique to Canadian anthropology. Um, I do think, however, that there are many things characteristic of anthropology that are of different valence in the Canadian context. The ongoing influence of British anthropology, 
the presence, even though it's regionally rather specific, of French anthropology, anthropological traditions. Um, there's much more awareness, I think, of, of things other than American, whereas American anthropology in the U.S. is very closed off. They don't even seem to know that, that Canada is a different country. When they talk about Boas doing fieldwork in British Columbia, they do not seem to understand that this is a rather different social, political, economic context. And so there's a great deal of Canadian anthropology that is written and has to be written for a Canadian audience, I think. Um, and then there are other things where we can try and explain this to the rest of the world that don't always go quite so smoothly. And I think we need to recognize that difficulty before we, we try to assume that we're all just North American anthropologists. I can argue several sides of that question. There are more than two. <laughs>